Hey guys, what is up? Niad here with Film Comics Explained, and we are back with the second chapter of Alien's Female War. When we had left, Ripley was awoken from cryosleep by an overzealous captain named Hankerson, who desired to head back to LV-426. I mean, the nightmare doesn't seem to end for Ripley, who has done everything she can to rid herself of this evil. Hankerson forced Ripley to join his marines in their search of the derelict for salvageable data. Ripley waited outside the ship in the APC while the marines ventured in, only to encounter the xenomorphs that had survived the explosion. While they were being attacked, something in the derelict was triggered, which then began to telepathically transmit the thoughts and revelations made by the space jockey about the true nature of the xenomorphs. Hankerson was shot in the back by one of his men after explaining to Ripley that his marines were expendable and didn't matter to him. We then saw Ripley take off with the surviving marines, just before they remotely detonated the APC, destroying any potential samples for the company. We returned to find Ripley explaining that she kept thinking of Newt, but also had thoughts of Hankerson's mission and the idea of the aliens ever getting to Earth. The three of them disappeared for a while to the outer colonies. Ripley was praying that the corporation would never find their precious specimen, but they did, causing the outbreak to occur on Earth. This led Ripley, Tully and the other Grunt no choice but to come back and try to help. Hicks asks how Ripley intended to save them, and Tully explains that they were going to Ripley's Genesis world with the hopes of blowing the Xenomorphs up at their source. We head to Newt who is having nightmares. She explains that at night she just wants to sleep and forget, but that is when she becomes that little girl again. She returns to Asheron, to the hell of her youth, where the aliens took her and pulled her into their nest. She tells us that the nightmares are always the same. The alien honours her with its seed, with its darkness, and suddenly, she is part of something magnificent and powerful. Something that transcends human weakness. That's when she sees her. She's not of Asheron. She's not of any world. She takes root where it serves her, spreading her progeny like some malignant disease. By night, she is the monster that consumes Newt. By day, she is the one who waits for her. We return to Earth to find some of the last few people on Earth. The young girl asks her father if they are going to survive, and he tells her that everyone must pass on at some stage, explaining that it's the way of things. He then tells us that he doesn't understand what is happening. It's the middle of summer and the temperature is a chilling negative degrees Celsius. He asks what is going on, before telling us it was only a matter of time before the aliens killed them or used them for breeding. He pulls down some wiring from the surface and asks his brother Ben to give him a hand. Paul is finding it difficult to stay positive and we see him say that the automatic machines will hum into the next century, but humans will not be around to see it. Ben tells him to quit it, but we see Paul telling him to look around and see that this isn't Earth anymore, it's become a new world, their world. Ben grabs his brother and shows him the gun, explaining that he had three shots left. He goes on to say that he knows what they are up against, and knows their chances. He then tells his brother that there is a reason why they were here, a reason those things haven't taken them. Someone is out there. We return to Newt who wakes up from a dream and tells us that she can feel it. She then gets a message from the bridge notifying her that they started receiving Earth transmissions. The technician doesn't know how, but says the auto scanners were picking it up. He tells her that they must have found a way to tap into the ground relays insisting that somebody down there really wants to talk. We then hear Ben's voice. They're using the underground to move freely beneath the city. The tunnels and grids are still here, but changed, transformed. We tried staying above ground, but so many have been taken by the alien. They identify with the creatures, hunting us to appease their new master. It, uh, it's difficult to be sure, but the tunnels appear to converge into a central locus, like spokes on a wheel. We're coming closer to the hub. There are more bodies now, fused into the walls like mad sculpture. I used to wonder why they reclaimed themselves, filled their world with the decay of death. And then I realized, they're immersed in death. Perhaps that terrible, sheer finality is the only thing they truly understand. Jesus. Paul. Do you hear that? We heard stories from other cities about alien breeders. Dozens were found and destroyed back when we still had hope. But they said the creatures bred in isolation to protect the nascent eggs. This one's exposed in the open as if, as if she's waiting for something. 
Ben then tells his brother that they should move back to the tunnels as he didn't like being here. We can also see a hand reach out from behind and pull him in. It's one of the bodies that has fused into the wall. He tells them that she wants them as he holds on to Ben. Paul grabs his brother and pulls him up as a decaying man tells him to look at it and see what it has become, indicating the bulge in his stomach. He then tells them it's so beautiful as it begins to burst out of his chest. The chest burster is about to attack the two men, but we see a bullet fly past it. We then see Ben picking Amy up as she continues to fire the last two shots, killing the creature in the process. We hear Ben saying that the aliens must have heard the shots, indicating that they needed to move as he carries Amy off. We then see Newt covering her face in frustration. She runs to her personal quarters, yelling out, Not again! She explains that she wanted to steal a ship, a transport, anything. She couldn't bear to watch it happen again, but she knew Amy's only hope was Ripley's plan. It was the only hope for any of them. She looks at a photo of herself when she was younger, happy and with her family. She tells us that everyone she had ever loved had been taken away by the alien and insists that it wasn't going to happen again. We head to the bridge to find Hicks and Ripley arguing. Hicks can't believe that she is serious about her plan to go back out there because of a dream. Ripley tries to insist that it is more than a dream, and Hicks tells her that he doesn't care either way, stating that he's had enough of these missions. He goes on to say that they have been lucky to survive up until now, but assures her that their luck will run out sooner or later. Ripley calmly tells him that he is scared. Newt then walks in and says that they are all scared. She goes on to say that they all knew what the alien could do, before asking if that doesn't scare Ripley. Ellen tells her that it does, but not as much as knowing they are still out there and there is something that they can do to stop them. She tells them that none of them will find any peace until it is over. Hicks points out that Ripley wants to go on the offensive. He says that Earth is gone, overrun by those things, before asking her what has changed. Ripley says, nothing, everything. I've spent the last 15 years seeing her, feeling her, hoping the visions would stop. We then find them all getting to work on Ripley's plan. We can see several people re-engineering the lander by attaching a large spherical container to its base. We can see the chief commander explaining that they should be finished by tonight, but he doesn't get what Ripley is planning to transport. Tully tells him that she isn't exactly sure either. He goes on to say that there were no real specs, no dimensions, no weight projections, insisting that they were really pushing it. We can see them inside the dark void of the container, as they all agree that nobody knows anything. Tully then asks if McPhee was a religious man, before explaining she is learning it's important to believe in something, anything, even dreams. We can see Tully and McPhee moving throughout the back rooms of Gateway Station. McPhee says, We're as crazy as Ripley, flying halfway to hell, and for what? Even if this thing exists, who says we'll be able to catch it? Ripley convinced the base commander to hold them while she arranged for a ship. The storerooms have been under lock and key ever since. Seems the idea of having them aboard gives the folks here the jitters. Tully looks at the xenomorphs on the ground and says that they were dead, asking why the crew couldn't understand that. McPhee then tells her that she was right, before admitting that sometimes even he has trouble understanding it. Newt tells us that Ripley had asked for her to head to the space station's dry dock to complete preparations for launch. She notes how funny it was how they clung to their primitive cycle of day and night, and the ritual of the sun, before stating that it's always dark in space. They bend the truth to accommodate their human weaknesses, whereas the alien merely adapts. We can see them taking the xenomorph corpses out and laying them aboard the interior of the sphere. Ripley explains that they had a couple of specimens in order to run biological and weapons tests before everything went to hell. She tells us that they were born ugly and stay ugly. The station commander enters the bridge and asks if he can have a word with Ripley. He tells her that he will not allow the launch to proceed until she can find a command rated pilot to operate it. He explains that when they started this project, she had told him Hicks could do it. Ripley explains that he changed his mind and tells him not to quote regulations in a time like this. He then urges her that this isn't a technical squabble out of the recruitment manual. He is talking about common sense. The ship has been reconfigured for gravity drive and he insists that she can't just get behind the wheel and take her for a spin. Hicks then appears and says that he better fly it then. We can see all hands are on deck with the marines and crew doing last minute checks. We can see Newt looking off to earth as she says, Ever since I was a little girl, I've found that promises are little more than lies meant to be broken. But as we prepared for liftoff, I made a promise to myself and to a little girl I've never met. 
Ripley had put together a crew from the space station's stranded military contingent, intriguing them with the opportunity to fight again. But there were still questions among the team about their mission. Hicks tells Ripley that the gravity drive is nominal and that their fuel was good. He is about to move the ship, but we see Ripley asking him to halt before questioning him about why he is helping. He tells her that he wasn't sure, saying that maybe this last mission was all he's got other than Ripley's dreams and his nightmares. We can see the retrofitted ship blast out of Gateway Station. Three days into their journey, we can see Ripley briefing the team on their mission. We've been in space three days now. You've had a chance to meet one another and speculate on the nature of our mission. I appreciate your faith, since that's all that we've really got. Ten years ago, I made contact with an extraterrestrial intelligence. It, uh, it spoke to me. Told me of the world that first spawned the alien. The drones are only vassals, guided by a superior external intelligence. Many of us have felt this alien presence. The tortured, empathetic bond it shares with its children. Its hunger to be whole again. The creatures were never meant to be apart. Together, they create the nexus of alien life. One cannot endure without the other. But they were separated, spreading between worlds like seeds in the wind. And through it all, she's been calling them, calling them back. One of the grunts jokes that Mama misses her kids before asking what they were going to do about it. Ripley then says, she wants her babies. We can't bring them to her. So we'll bring her to Earth in this. The shields are impervious to the alien's acid, but more importantly, they'll suggest home, family, her lost brood. One of the grunts is clearly annoyed that they have been brought out here to act as chauffeurs for an alien family reunion. It's here that Hicks remembers Orana's bombs from Outbreak. He informs them all that before Earth was lost, a government scientist named Orana conceived a plan to detonate multiple nuclear warheads in the infested areas, but had himself died before he could trigger them. Ripley then says, this thing, this mother queen, will draw her children to her. She'll try to replicate the world they left behind, and when they've joined in their grand union, we'll destroy them. We'll destroy them all. Unfortunately, that's all that we have time for today. It's really starting to pick up, and I hope you guys are also on the edge of your seats. Please let me know what you guys think of the chapter, and the story as a whole. Don't forget to support the creative artists by following the link in the description. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to hit like and to subscribe to stay up to date on all my content. And please, don't forget to subscribe to my Facebook to find out what content is coming out next and when. Alright guys, stay awesome. Niad here with Film Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by.